Andrea, could you just keep an eye and um, allow people in as they enter? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Looks like people are coming in. Welcome, everyone. Nice to see you today. We're going to give maybe one more minute here, 30 seconds before we get started. Okay. So we are recording this meeting today um, and we'll let you know at the end where to find it uh, on our website. Uh, in the meantime, welcome to everybody for uh, Care Farming Network's March monthly gathering. Uh, we are discussing all things social media related today. Um, if you would care to do so, um, feel free to put who you are. And if you are um, a member of a care farm or an organization, go ahead and throw it in the chat. It's always fun to see uh, where people are coming from, see what parts of the country are represented. So feel free to use that chat function. Um, if you've been with at one of our member gatherings before, you'll already know this. For those that haven't, the way this works is we're gonna spend the next hour um, on the topic of social media. Uh, we host these member gatherings every month, the first Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern time. These are always free for members and they're part of our commitment to supporting the Care Farming Network and helping to improve practices for care farms. Uh, we will have these uh, this, all of our monthly member gatherings can be found on our past events page um, at carefarmingnetwork.org. And then we'll also go ahead and um, we post them on social media and other places too. So with that being said, um, Gabrielle is our presenter today. And uh, Gabrielle is a community organizer and educator and musician based in Rockville. Uh, they joined Care Farming Network's team in May of 2022 as a social media manager. And for the past 10 years, they've been managing social media pages across Facebook and Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. As an autistic self-advocate, Gabrielle runs the Instagram page at Autism Awareness, which has over 13,000 followers, and through which they share educational and entertaining content, from an actually autistic lens. Gabrielle's brother participates in a job training program with one of CFN's member farms. So Gabrielle's very passionate about the empowerment and social opportunities that care farms are able to provide. And you can find Gabrielle almost anywhere online with the username. Well, you know what, I'll throw it in the chat. So super excited um, working with Gabrielle for the last year on the, at the Care Farming Network. I think our social media channels are really great. We are really excited to also uh, present and spotlight other organizations that are using social media really well. Um, whether or not you love social media or you hate it, I think we can all agree that it is an important thing to um, understand and use nowadays. And with that, I am gonna pass it over to Gabrielle who knows much more about it than I do. So thanks Gabrielle. Thank you for that introduction. Hi, um, my name is Gabrielle. Uh, and yeah, so we are going to mainly just be discussing, discussing um, throughout today's meeting as the monthly member gatherings tend to go. But before we go into discussions and um, maybe giving each other tips and things like that, um, I'm first just going to share a few slides of which I need to do screen share, start broadcast. Um, one, two, three. Okay, it is now screen sharing. Um, yes, so just a few slides on a very um, comprehensive introduction um, to social media for care farms. Um, and where's the button to make this? It's okay. I think it's, it's easy enough to be like this. Um, but yeah, so if you are new to social media, um, or if you've been on social media and you feel like maybe you're not achieving the goals that you want to do with the social media for your care farm, um, these are six questions for consideration 
for your social media pages. And um, we can also include these in uh, the follow-up blog post. Um, so no need to, to answer all of these right now, um, but just some things to think about maybe as we discuss later. First being, what is the primary goal of your page? Um, for some care farms, that's reaching prospective participants, donors, or volunteers. For others, it's reaching prospective customers for CSA or for other products you sell. And for some, it's raising awareness of a specific population group, issue, or type of therapy. And for many care farms, they're doing all of these at once, which is really cool and great, but it can make it kind of overwhelming um, to strategize on your social media. So identifying what the primary goal of your page is can help you with the rest of these. Um, the second one being how much time can you realistically allocate to social media in a day or week? If you have a volunteer or intern whose specific job is social media, um, then that's a lot more time than if you are running your email list and your day-to-day -day operations and phone. If you're running everything yourself, uh, that's not a lot of time that you can realistically allocate to social media and that's okay. Um, some care farms are posting multiple times a day, which is very cool. And some care farms don't need to do that and it's not really aligned with their goals. Um, the third thing is just to look at different social media platforms for different goals. Um, most care farms that are in our network are quite active on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and then some of them are quite active on TikTok as well, but very few. Um, and I could, if anyone has questions later about different platforms for different um, goals, we can talk about that. But then some care farms are also really active on LinkedIn and that can be a really good place for finding um, partnerships with local businesses and organizations. For example, if you are um, a flower farm and a lot of your revenue can come from like making displays for local businesses and events, um, LinkedIn could be good for that. But yeah, there's also a bunch of other social media pages as well. Um, we recently started using Reddit at the Care Farming Network um, and have brought a few people in from there. So yeah, just lots of, so many different social media platforms now to use. Um, and I did not mention Twitter, but Twitter can be good as well. Um, number four being, what do outsiders want to see from your care farm? Do you have cute animals, pretty flowers, delicious food, heartwarming interactions, storytelling, or maybe tutorials or information? Social media content is most successful when it does one or more of five things I wrote for. Entertain, educate, inspire, empower, and engage. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit more on the, uh, two slides from here. Um, and then what do insiders expect to see when they follow your farm? So insiders being people who are already members or participants or pe people who would be um, engaged with your farm in even if the social media didn't exist. So do they want information about upcoming events or CSA uh, or other things? And are those things also communicated through a member portal or an email list or Facebook group um, or another method that might be more effective than social media, less effective, or can be used in conjunction with each other? And then the last thing, which um, doesn't uh, it doesn't affect a lot, but it, it has come up with some of our member farms when we made featured Farm Friday posts. Uh, what policies does your organization have or the organizations that you work with um, about including participants or volunteers faces, uh, et cetera, in photo and video? Um, that's not really like a social media consideration, but um, it's definitely something to be cognizant of um, when you are you know, putting together content. Um, and taking photos and videos in general. And so when I talked about educate, entertain, inspire, engage, and empower, this is just a brief description of each of those. Um, and so educating is kind of sharing knowledge that people would find useful, whether that's um, something about, here's how you can grow a tomato plant in your own home, um, or something about the history of care farming or of your farm. Um, entertaining is very straightforward, um, just providing social media content that people want to see because they are amused by it. This is very often animals, but sometimes it's just a really beautiful photo of the sunset at your farm 
or um, of a really nice display of flowers or really delicious food. Um, inspiring, making people feel something, inspiring them to take action um, and get more involved. So with Care Farms a lot, there are many stories that you can tell, uh, pictures or videos that are inspiring because Care Farms you know, have missions um, beyond just creating, um, beyond just the farming. They, they have something that's attached to that. And so uh, a lot of businesses have a lot of trouble with this Inspire point, but uh, this is really one of the strong ones for us. Um, engaging to start a conversation. So sometimes people um, will make a post and say, caption this post, and it'll be like a picture of, I'm not giving a good example here, <laughs> um, but for example, um, like a new a new animal is born on a farm and you have a contest that uh, leave your best name in the caption and we'll choose one of these names for this new animal. Um, anything that uh, engages the audience and inspires or not inspires and encourages them to either comment or share or um, send you a message. And then the last one is empower which is providing your audience with the tools or information they need to actually do something, to get outside, of, uh, get involved outside of social media. And so this can be something as simple as a flyer for an event, instructions on how to vote for you in a contest so you can win a grant, just um, empowering them to do something. And if you look up like the four E's or five E's of social media, there's a bunch of different variations of these online. Some of them, for example, um, they combine empower and inspire or empower and engage and call it involve or they'll combine empower and inspire and yeah there's a bunch of different ways that this information is presented online but I think these five to me make the most sense um and then some examples of these are like with the Philly Goat Project um this first one is to me I see that and I think this is empowering people it is giving them exactly the information they need the context they need to go out and join you on a goat walk and maple sugar talk. Um, and then this next one uh, after that is a really great example of an educational post. Um, it has seven slides and it's sharing information about um, the significant Philadelphians uh, who their goats are named after in honor of Black History Month. Um, so that's really cool educational content um, that isn't even like a farm tutorial or anything, it's it's more like historical. And then um, here we have very entertaining content where they put their goats in costumes um, and gave them little speech bubbles of what they were saying for happy Halloween. Um, and then as an example, like you can always mix these and it's best when you do. Um, this one, is a really entertaining photo to me personally, um, but then it's followed up with empowerment. It's giving you the information. Here's what you can do to join us. Here's this really cool event that you can come and be a part of, or some of these that are um, inspiring and they'll say, look how inspired you are by the stuff we're doing. And here's how you can donate to make sure more of this stuff happens. Um, so yeah, that's basically, all of these different types of posts. And then the very last thing, this is such a short, short list of the many care farms that are doing a super great job with social media, but I just highlighted eight that are all, um, I think quite different from each other. The two with stars are doing really well on TikTok. Um, but yeah, these are just, Philly Girl Project is just the one that I pulled those examples from, but all of these plus many, many more, and I'm sure uh, a bunch of the social media accounts of you all who are on this call um, have many more great examples and are doing really cool things with their social media. But yeah, this is just like from different types of farms and pages. So yeah, that's those are my slides. Um, actually, there's one more. Um, my last slide is just about quick tips, um, especially for beginners. And so when someone finds you on one platform, make sure that they're able to navigate to your other platforms. Um, a lot of care farms, when I was doing, for example, the Featured Farm Friday posts, I found that their Instagram and Facebook weren't connected in the way that they can be connected to Meta. And if you do that, 
Um, when you make a post to one social media page, it can automatically post to the other, which saves you time. And you can also use Meta, um, Meta is the company that owns Facebook and Instagram. Um, and you can also use their business suite on your computer or I think on uh, mobile apps um, to schedule posts ahead of time now. That's really new for Instagram um, as of the last few months that you can schedule Instagram posts ahead of time. Um, and so you can schedule posts to be posted to Instagram and Facebook at the same time with the same people tagged and the same this and that only if you have the two connected. Um, and then a lot of care farms I found as well do not have updated social media links on their website um, or their social media doesn't link back to their website. And then the same thing kind of goes for email, like on social media, there's um, on Instagram and Facebook, at least there's a little spot where you can put the like the general information email for your organization. Um, and then in your email signature, it can have little logos at the bottom that uh, link to your social media. So those are just ways to keep things consistent that if someone finds you in one way, um, you make sure that they know how to find you anywhere else. And then just the tools that I use the most are Fonto and Canva. Um, I know there's many other tools that other people like to use as well. Um, but yeah, okay, that is all of my very much information. Um, and the rest of this time is just for you all. Any questions you want to ask, any um, concerns or troubles you're having, anything that has gone really well for you on social media that you'd love to share and help out other kick farms. Yeah. We also, you have the ability to unmute yourself. And so as a member gatherer, you can certainly type something in chat. You're more than welcome to, and I can help uh, throw those questions out there, but feel free also to unmute yourself if you'd like to just share something. Uh, I, I have a question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm obviously very anxious to ask it. Go for it, Becca. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I have a question for you, some advice. What if you or your staff or your students started a social media account, you know, a while ago, it didn't really have direction, and now you want it to have direction? Do you think it's better to start fresh, you know, kind of race past posts, or just let it evolve naturally? Which platform is this account on? Um, let's see, we have Facebook, we have Instagram, we have TikTok, and uh, my, my students put these together and they're fun and they're wonderful, but I haven't really, uh, you know, supervised them doing it. So I'd like to add some direction. I'm really glad that you're speaking today. So I'm just wondering, I love their content. I'd love to keep it. But, you know, sometimes when people go onto a site, they'll scroll down and then it won't really look like the new content. So do you think it's better to delete old content? and start anew or allow all the content to evolve? What I would personally do is not delete the old content because it shows that you've been established, you've been around for a while um, and you're evolving, which is very cool. Uh, the only reason I asked about platforms is because I know that different platforms have mainly TikTok and the way that its algorithm works is that it tends to po uh, push out the first two or three posts when a new account is made um, because it's they're really just trying to get you hooked onto the platform. So when you have a TikTok account that's inactive for a while and then you make it active again, um, it doesn't, it, it takes a while to get your stuff to, to show up in more people's feeds. Um, but for Facebook and Instagram, I wouldn't advise like creating a new account. Um, it's definitely, if you, if you wanna have a very cohesively branded account, what you can do is archive the posts. So you're not actually deleting them, uh, yeah, but okay. they just won't appear on the, um, on, you know, when people click on your profile, they won't appear there. But if you ever wanted to show them back on your page later on, once maybe you have more of your new glossy posts, um, right. then you can always just unarchive them. That's a good um, idea. So yeah, I really recommend on Instagram, if for some reason you, you don't want to post to show up on your profile to archive instead of deleting, um, okay. but just for TikTok, I, I'm really not sure. It's just that I've, I've seen recommended a lot um, that if instead of trying to revive an old account, um, it's usually better to start a new one just because of the way that they push out posts onto the For You page. Um, TikTok, for those who are unfamiliar, um, is very oriented towards showing your posts to people who don't already follow you. Whereas Instagram and Facebook, for the most part, 
um, focus on showing your posts to the people that already follow you, aside from reels on Instagram and Facebook. Um, so that's why on TikTok, it's a little different. But if you have a username that you really want to keep on TikTok and you start a new account and then you don't know if you'll be able to get a great username, then it might it might just be worth keeping it anyway. So it's that's why it's like kind of iffy. But I would definitely recommend on Instagram and Facebook not to delete things, but maybe to archive them and not to like start over your account. Um, yeah, that's my recommendation. I don't know if anyone else has great recommendations for that. I, do you mind if I piggyback on that? So w about sharing from an old account, how effective do you think are hashtags? That's a great question. I think um, for something as niche as care farming, um, and especially if you're working within a specific location or specific population groups, mm -hmm. hashtags can be very helpful. Um, hashtags are not very helpful when they are what when people are, are using a hashtag that hundreds and thousands of other people are already using because it just leaves their posts to get lost in, in all of those but if you are doing like hashtag care farming there aren't very many very many people who are using that hashtag so someone who's interested in care farming who is following you can now on instagram and I believe on TikTok, follow a hashtag in addition to following accounts. If someone is very interested in care farming and they follow hashtag care farming, they will see your post because there's not hundreds and thousands of people who are using hashtag care farming. Um, and depending on what other things um, you use, you know, if you're a flower farm, doing hashtag flowers is not going to be very effective. Um, but if you know exactly what your target audience is for a specific post, then making hashtags that are relevant to that target audience and, and them alone uh, will be very effective, at least in my experience. Um, also using tools such as location, um, when you make a post, even if your post isn't like a picture of a place, but it's a post that's relevant to people like in Rockville, Maryland, and you tag the location as Rockville, Maryland, then it will show up on the geotagging features of the social media platform. So people in that area are more likely to see the post than people in an area where the information is not as relevant. Awesome, thank you. Gabrielle, Nancy was asking if you can show the free Fonto app picture. Um, yes. Because so there's I a bunch of them and she's, yeah. Oops, it looks like Katie. P-H-O-N-T-O. -O. So this is Fonto. I, I believe it's free. I've had this app since I was 12, which was more than 10 years ago. And so maybe I bought it for like 99 cents and just forgot at this point, but I believe it's free. Um, and it's a really great app. You can go onto different websites like Doff, like if, if you're looking for a specific font you'd like to use, um, there, there are websites where you can download fonts for free and import it into this app. And so um, you can also add your own, uh, fonts that you like created with your own handwriting um, and you can add pictures and things. So every single post that I've made on the Care Farming Network page, except for the Thanksgiving post, which I made on Canva, basically every single post I made using Fonto, including like this one, uh, they have templates to make it look like it's a lined piece of paper um, or just that you can save your, uh, just like on Canva, which is a lot more popular than Fonto, um, especially because you can use Canva on a computer. I believe Fonto is only on um, mobile devices and iPads, um, that you can like save the, the format of a post and then use it again, like every time you make a similar post, like what I did with the, the Feature Farm Fridays always look the same and the, um, the missed hour MMG and all of those. So yeah, I, I mainly use Fonto because I became familiar with it many years ago, but um, Canva is definitely the more popular option. And the, the nice thing about Canva too, is that you can um, collaborate uh, on Canva. So you can share your Canva project with someone else who's working from a different computer and then you can both type into it and make changes, kind of like Google Docs. Cool. I just downloaded Fonto and it is free. Oh, cool. Great. There's a, um, Gracie. I have. Yeah. Can uh, you this app Gracie? One more time? Oh, sorry. Oops. Let's go with Gracie and then Nancy. Okay. Um, I recently, I, I'm, um, a member. I don't even know what it's called, but anyway, I get, I'm a part member of the tech soup 
uh, group, which is a thing for nonprofits to um, buy and get stuff at, at discounts. And I recently got something from them talking about a um, community oriented nonprofit, dis nonprofit distributed um, social media called F E D I V E R S E, Fediverse. And um, so we're looking into using that, certainly in addition to, but maybe instead of all the others, because it is supposedly controlled more within uh, nonprofit systems. Um, I'm getting all kinds of, we only recently, like a week ago, got our Facebook running and I get so many things that have absolutely nothing to do with what I've posted. And, uh, so, you know, so I kind of turned that over to somebody else, but, but um, I would like to avoid that. <laughs> Number one, it's totally irrelevant and I'm not gonna spend time on it. And I don't really want the person that I'm paying to help me to spend time. Anyway, I wanna know, do you know anything about Fediverse, F-E-D-I-V-E-R-S-E? I am, I'm actually not familiar with Fediverse, though I am familiar with uh, Ethos and a few other apps that have similar missions um, to Fediverse. But yeah, that sounds really interesting. The one thing I would say about it, though, is um, it, it seems like a great thing to use, but that depending on who your target audience is, they most likely are not on that app, or at least they're not on it yet. And so usually when a new app um, comes up, if you have the time and the interest in doing so, it's great to make an account on a new app that seems like it would be useful to you, especially because if you are you know, among the first users of an application, um, you are, are more likely to be found and seen by those who are using the app before it becomes uh, oversaturated. And also you're able to get exactly the username that you wanna get because it's not already taken on that app. Um, but just that I would, I would advise against using only that application because um, most of the people who you want to be seeing information about your care farm are not using that application. But you can use tools such as, um, oh, I forgot what it's called. I think it's called If Then. There's like a, um, outside of the, the meta business suite, um, there, there are different online tools that can automate. If you make a post to one website or app, it will post that same photo and caption to all these other accounts that you connect to this website. And so if you really want to avoid even, you know, opening Facebook on your computer or phone, uh, you can do it all automated now where you only post into the app that you want to be using and then it'll copy that same stuff over into Facebook, Instagram, and anywhere else. The only thing about that is um, the, the, the stuff that you're posting isn't necessarily optimized for every platform. For example, if you're posting a photo, uh, you can't use that with TikTok, um, but it's definitely something to look into. I will find the name of it. Um, if you want to avoid being on any apps, but still want your content to show up there. Would you spell the name of the other uh, thing yeah, that I'm, you thought was similar? Well, I wrote it in the chat. It's called Ethos um, and it is called, uh, yes, Ethos Social Media App. Um, it's the home of social discussion and it is launched to offer it's, it's a social media app to connect with causes you care about, is what they say. I don't know much about that. And then on, on the app store, as opposed to being called a social network, they call themselves a social change network. So that's just, it's, it's one I've heard of recently that sounds like it's kind of similar to the one you were describing. Um, but in addition to the traditional social media platforms, especially if, uh, for anyone who has a very locally focused um, purpose, there are apps like Nextdoor, um, and there are also Facebook groups that are neighborhood-based that may be very uh, useful to post your information into. Um, Nextdoor is an app for neighborhoods, and so businesses, organizations, and like people that are part of any specific neighborhood um, can join, join their Nextdoor neighborhood group. Um, and it's, it's really useful for getting information to only the people who live right in your neighborhood. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that um, if anyone else has an app you use that we haven't mentioned yet, please send it in the chat and we can compile a list and include it in the follow-up post. Um, but yeah, 
any ADA issues that could should be considered when using social media. That is entirely something I should have included in the considerations. Before I get to that, did Nancy still have a question? No, okay, cool. Um, yeah, so that is entirely something I should have included. Um, if you want your content to be accessible to those who um, have different disabilities, then there are a bunch of things to take into consideration. And I'm hoping that everyone here wants their content to be accessible. Um, and it really doesn't add much extra work if you know how to do things effectively. So for those who are blind or low vision, um, many of them will have screen reading devices embedded into their phones or computers, but screen readers are only effective when the screen gives them something to read. And so if you're posting lots of photos and videos, um, Instagram and Facebook do have automatic, um, what they call alt text, uh, that they add onto photos and videos just based off of what their algorithms, what, what their computer things decide to believe that they see in your photos and videos, and then they try to categorize it and name it. Um, but even just including a simple sentence of alt text is very useful. And on Twitter, um, alt text is not automatic. So I'll go to a care farming post on Twitter, for example. And so when you see the care farming network here, it, it's on a phone screen, so it doesn't look very great. Um, there's a tiny little button in the corner that says alt. And if you click on it, it will show the alt text that we posted, the image description. And so for this one, I wrote headline, missed our January monthly member gathering, image, screenshot of Care Farming Network's recent blog post. Text, you can find the recording as well as links to resources shared during the gathering and our recent blog post. And so I just took all of the text that I had in this photo and wrote it out so that if someone is using Twitter with a screen reader, um, they're able to hear exactly what the photo says and also in addition to the text that was in the photo, I said, oh, this photo also includes a screenshot of our website. Um, and if you're posting, you know, a photo of a goat, I don't know why everything's rolling around goats today. It, you, you don't have to be super descriptive with it. You can say a photo of a goat on our farm. Or if you want to, um, there's this one Twitter account that does a really good job with, with uh, creative alt text. It's called, I think it's called like she rates dogs. It's someone who um, you send her photos of dogs and then she rates them. Um, and they're always more than 10 out of 10, these ratings. Um, but like the way that she does the alt text is really great because um, it's very representative of the, the personality of the dogs that she's rating. Um, but yes, I will, I will send that later so that I don't have to scroll and find it. But that's just an example. Um, it's really, for most things, you can just do a sentence or even if all of the information you need is included in the caption, um, you can say like on the alt text box, you can just write all of the text in this image is included in the caption. And so the people who are using a screen reader know that they're getting everything they need from the caption. Um, another thing is that when you post videos, um, and this is for those who are deaf or hard of hearing, um, make sure that your videos either have open captioning or closed captioning. Most social media platforms, again, will provide automatic closed captioning, um, though it just might not be accurate to the words you're saying, especially if you're saying the names of places or people or things that just aren't like typically used words. Um, the nice thing now is that on Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram, I'm not certain about Twitter, when it does the automatic captioning for you, you can go in and edit that. So you don't have to type up L, all of the captions to what you're doing. You can just edit like if they missed a word or if they um, wrote on instead of and because of like your pronunciation or something like that, you can just edit what you need to and then keep their automatic closed captioning. So mm -hmm. closed captioning is when um, the captions aren't like a part of the video and they just they're uh they kind of appear and you can turn it on or off whereas open captioning is when a video like the captions are a part of the visuals of the video if that makes sense um and so it's like if you make a video in a video editing app and put the captions onto there and you can't like when you upload the video someone can't just turn off the captions um that's open captioning if i understand correctly um so yeah and there are men many um free websites online that if for some reason you don't want to use the automatic captioning services provided by these social media platforms, um, you can have the captioning done on these websites. One of them that I like to use the most is otter.ai. 
Um, and it's also nice because it can do auto captioning for things like Zoom meetings or um, classes in school. Um, but yeah, that is, um, those are the main two things that I would mention in terms of making things accessible. And then there's another link that I can include in our follow-up post, which just has general accessibility guidelines for social media um, and websites. And it will include things like um, what colors to avoid using together. Because if someone's colorblind and you're using this color text on this color background, even though you know they contrast well, uh, someone who's colorblind won't be able to read it. Um, or uh, there are certain things like strobe or certain neon colors or things that can be very um, overwhelming to those with sensory processing issues, um, which a lot of basically almost all autistic people have some form of sensory processing disorder, or sensory processing issues, um, or especially, you know, with strobe lights, someone with epilepsy. I don't assume that any of the care farms are posting things with strobe in them, but there are some social media trends that have that. So um, yeah, but anyway, there there's a website I will link that um, just is like a more comprehensive guide on accessibility for a wider range of disabilities um, on social media. But the, the two main things I would absolutely note are alt text and um, and captioning are will meet the needs of, of many different disabilities. Gabrielle, Ashley had a question here around what is your recommendation on frequency of posts? That is a great question. And it kind of goes back to that point of consideration I mentioned about how much time you can realistically allocate to social media. Um, the frequency of your posts is not as important as the consistency. So if you are really excited about posting every single day, and that's really great, and it, it, it kind of fades out after two weeks, that's a lot worse than if you decide from the beginning, I'm going to post once a week. And I'm going to keep posting once a week for the next like five years, if that makes sense. Um, so frequency just really depends on what you have the capacity for. And the nice thing about most social media platforms is that there are different types of posts that have different levels of like how easy it is to make them. So on Instagram and Facebook, for example, there's this thing called stories, which is where um, you make a post that's like a very casual post and it only shows up for 24 hours and then it disappears. And so we utilize this a lot when we are sharing other farms um, content. And so if we see that um, this farm made some really cool uh, edible terrarium arrangements and we're like, oh my gosh, we think our audience would really like that. We can click the share button the same button you use to send a direct message and click add reel to story. And so for 24 hours, anyone who follows us can go to our story and see this. And that's all the effort it took, that's a post. Um, it's not a post that will show up in our profile forever, but it's something that keeps us active and keeps our name in people's minds when they you know, are visiting social media. And it's a way that we can connect, even if it's not something that's coming from us, even if it's something we're sharing from another farm, it's a way that um, we can connect our followers with the things they might be interested in and also a way that we can easily support just with the click of technically three buttons, um, easily support our friends, our collaborating organizations, um, the, the, the care farms that we want to support. Um, so yeah, they're sharing onto your story, which is something that is easy enough to do once a day, um, in my opinion. But then for making a post where you know, you're, you're taking a nice photo or you're putting text into um, a graphic design or things like that, um, once a week is the minimum that I would personally recommend if you want to keep your page active and kind of on the radar of those who might have interest in your organization. Um, but it's really, while there are some care farms who are posting every day, you should only post as much as you have um, to offer, whether that be in terms of your time availability, but also in terms of the content that you're making. So if you have events that are happening every week, just posting that flyer each week is a very easy thing to do. But if you only have events happening once a month, um, then you, I mean, you know, you can post reminders and things like that, but you shouldn't make posts just to make them. You should make them because they have some sort of value to people, whether it's educating them, entertaining them, um, empowering them to, you know, information like a flyer. Um, so 
that's a very non-straightforward answer. The point being that the frequency is not as important as the consistency and the quantity is not as important as the quality. And when I say quality, I don't mean you have to have like a professional photographer and video editor, just that quality in the, in the sense that your post provides some sort of value in terms of like the four E's and one I or whatever I was listing earlier. Um, it provides some sort of value to the people who are viewing it. It's not just something that fills up their screen and, and keeps them glued to their phones for no reason. That's very helpful. Thank you. Gabrielle, I'm going to ask a question because this is something that I've been learning by working with you that I had no idea and I wish I would have. We've talked often as we've um, uh, been adding social media or doing our own social media at Care Farming Network around when it's uh, wise and not to add links into your <laughs> yeah. posts. And I have, well, can you just speak to that a little bit? Because as you keep talking about these algorithms and what the social media gods and goddesses are doing behind the scenes. So yeah, so most social media platforms have the goal of keeping people in their app or on their website. They don't want people to leave. And so they kind of deprioritize in because feeds um, on Instagram, for example, used to be chronological. You would see posts on your feed, feed being um, when you're on the home page and you're seeing the posts of the people you follow. You would see them basically just from people you follow, and you would see them in the order or maybe reverse order of when they were posted. But that's not the way that it works anymore, um, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, so uh, they they prioritize things that they think people would want to see or that they think would keep people on the platform and trying to see more. Um, and they deprioritize posts that have links in them because they don't want you to click on a link and leave their platform. They want to keep you on their platform. And so on Facebook, this is kind of easy to get around because often a link will be to like an event. And on Facebook, instead of linking to an outside place, you can just embed the Facebook event um, into, and when I say embed, I don't mean like with code and everything, you just click, it's just a few simple buttons, um, but you can just include the Facebook event in your post. And so you're keeping people on the platform and it will show your post to a lot of people who are following you. Um, but an extreme example of something that I noticed is that um, a few months ago, we had a few posts that you can see uh, even how many people viewed your post, even if they didn't comment or like it. Um, and so we had several posts that had around 400 views all in a row. And then we had a post that had a link to, I think it was to our next monthly member gathering registration site. And that post got seven views. And so that's not about how good our post is. It's not about who likes it or who has something to comment. It's about how many people Facebook is actually showing the post to in the first place. So it has no bearing on the quality of our posts. It's just, we included a link and Facebook doesn't like that. Um, and so that's why I use bit.ly, uh, bit.ly. And there are many other link shortening uh, pages out there, but that way um, I can include, like for this post, um, or sorry, for this event, um, on the post I included bit.ly slash March 2 MMG. That's a link that's very easy for someone to look at it and then type it in instead of a super long link that they would need to click on and it would be very tedious to type it. Or um, for, the, the, for the February one, it was bit.ly slash feb2mmg. Um, and so when you use a link shortener, you can include links in the images you post, as opposed to having links in the caption, which is kind of what sets off the red flag for Facebook and Instagram. Um, and it also just makes it easier for people to type in the link um, instead of, having to click on something because it's very long. Um, so I do recommend those websites where you're able to shorten um, links to things, whether it be about an event or signing up for CSA or things like that. Um, but yeah, that's definitely something to be aware of. Um, and then there are certain situations where using links is fine. Like when you're in a Facebook group, um, for some reason, I, th the way that Facebook group posts notify, like most people receive notifications when there's a post in a group that they're in. Um, by a page they're following versus if you're just posting it to your page. So if you post it in a group with a link, people are still likely to see it because they are getting notified for each post. Um, but that just depends on each person's individual settings that they set up on their account. But most people would get a notification. Um, so if you're posting within a group or within a, a direct message chat or something, then links have usually no problem. But if you're just posting to your followers or to the world just on your page, 
as a whole, usually links are not favored by the algorithms, um, which is very unfortunate. This problem does not seem to be as much of a thing on Twitter, though Twitter is constantly making changes over these last several months due to their change in ownership. And I, I do not claim to have any expertise on what the heck is happening with Twitter's algorithms right now. But once I figure that out, I will, I will let you all know. Um, yeah, that's about links. I think I covered that. <laughs> Becca, I love your question. Asking people to put their uh, social media handles, links, um, into chat so everyone can follow each other. Um, there's another question here around any recommendations um, on including clients in the process of social media, guest posts. What do you think? Um, me? Or like, does anyone have, yeah, does or, anyone have experience doing that? Otherwise I will jump in. Yeah, because also I want to open this up too. And like, if you have a social media page or post or something that yeah. you have found it really works for your organization, please feel free to share it. We can even yeah. do some screen oh. sharing here and go show it off. A lot that of the your ones chance in the to chat brag. are very social, uh, very successful social media pages. So if anyone has an answer for this question, um, feel free to jump in. Otherwise, I will jump in. I can jump in. Um, my name is Katie. I run the social platforms for Bittersweet Farm. So thank you for the shout out earlier. Um, and I think for us, this is always going to be a growing edge, um, always including our clients in the social content. Um, I've been managing our socials for almost four years now. And one of the things that I've prioritized is um, producing more content that is actually made by the clients. So if you follow our pages, you might've seen some pictures by a guy named Jerry. Um, I noticed that when I was out taking pictures, he loved my camera. So I just asked him if he would like to learn to take pictures himself with my camera and he was super excited. So we started actually every single week having a little photo session together. He takes some pictures, I take pictures of him. And then um, every once in a while, we'll post some of those on Facebook. People love to see that content. Um, it, it does super, super well. Um, just knowing that it's actually created by the client based on one of their passions. Um, and then even if I'm creating the content, taking the pictures, designing something, if I'm capturing a moment where a client is in the midst of an activity, like I will make the effort to talk to them about it. What do you love about what you're doing today? What's your favorite part? Um, anytime I can drop, you know, a direct quote, their language, their words for why this is meaningful. Um, that's always a super high priority for us. So th those are just some of my thoughts on that. Um, I uh, totally agree. I think that's awesome. And I think it's great to involve the clients as much as possible. Um, the, the only thing that I have run into with some, we actually, we have a media release form um, for our farm and for our programs. Um, I have a few parents who are um, guardians and um, really prefer not to have their uh, children I guess, advertised on social media. It's just, you know, it's a preference. Um, so I think just being really cognizant and, and, and careful with who you post, make sure that that's okay with them, make sure that that's okay with their families. Cause there are a few, it doesn't happen very often, um, at least not, not with my group, but it, it does happen where there's a parent who says absolutely no pictures, don't, don't post on social media, don't anything, so. If I could hop back in with like a word of encouragement on that, um, we have seen as we have, I mean, I think improved the quality of our socials over the years as we have grown and evolved, um, more and more of the guardians who did not previously signed photo and video consent forms have changed and said, hey, we see what you're doing. We want our uh, loved one involved in that. So that's been like a really exciting change over the years. And I don't know if everyone on here is like Medicaid funded, HIPAA regulated, but yes, um, being super on top of all of those things is, is a big part of this job that is not as much fun as the rest, but probably the most important part. Yeah, a, an easy way to kind of navigate the in-between of that 
um, is to encourage uh, your participants or their guardians to post their own photos and tag you. And then you're able to reshare those on your story. Um, and so you're not taking the, that it's just only the photos that um, guardians or um, participants uh, that they share on social media. And by it being shared on their public social media, it doesn't work if they have a private account, of course, but by it being shared on their public social media, if they have it, um, then if they tag you, you can just easily share it to your story or you can repost it to your, your profile. Um, and so that's kind of like a, a potential in between of those two things. And it's also very easy to do. And especially for people who are visiting your farm and you, know, you might not necessarily want them to like be making their own posts on your account or for them to take photos and stuff. Um, it's very easy for them to tag you and you just automatically share it to your story. And so you're not you know, giving them this, this spot on your profile, but you're highlighting them for 24 hours. Um, so yeah, I do, I, I guess I encourage encouraging um, those who want to take photos and, and have those photos shared, uh, encouraging them to tag you guys so that you're able to share out their photos. There's something in the chat. Oh, okay, just more social media. Does anyone else have, we are so low on time, um, but yeah, does anyone else have questions or um, something you wanna share regarding the things we have discussed or things we haven't discussed yet? I have like maybe one last question for you. Um, at Bittersweet, I am routinely asked to be highlighting on social media anywhere from five to seven campaigns at once. And, you know, we have different fundraising campaigns, events mm -hmm. going on. Um, we're always in the running for local awards. It's all really exciting, but I know that people's attention is uh, short on social media. And if I'm getting confused about what our current campaigns are, because there are so many, I know that our audience is getting confused as well. So mm -hmm. I would love like to hear if you have any advice for just like juggling all of that, especially yeah. across multiple platforms. Do you have like maybe a web page on your web, uh, the organization's website that just includes all of those in a list? We do. Typically our homepage is like the landing pad for that. So people mm -hmm. can easily find it and click. And then we also have an events page that if it's events based, it's there. We have a donate page. If it's fundraising, it's there. Um, but yeah, pretty much the homepage is that space. Yeah. So just bringing them kind of back to their home base, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. And then I also really like making compilation posts. Um, so for example, we get a lot of, uh, at Care Farming Network, um, a lot of information about job openings at different care farms that we like to share. And typically we'll share those out on our story individually, but um, we also like to, especially cause you know, that being on our story for 24 hours isn't necessarily effective. It's an opening that's mm -hmm. open for a long time. And so instead of sharing each of those on our feed, um, I've, periodically we'll make a compilation post where it's like, oh, if you're interested in job openings, then you can see these are the ones in North Carolina. These are the ones here. These are the, and the text is kind of small, um, and it's a it's a post that's only really useful to the people who are looking for that kind of thing. And so we're not going to like fill our feed with it, but definitely like maybe doing a weekly or biweekly roundup of like, do you want to support Bittersweet during the month of March? Here are mm -hmm. the seven ways, the seven different ways you can support us. Choose one or choose them all, you know? Um, and so the, the first page would say something like seven ways you can be involved in March. And then each slide would be the one page flyer, for example, mm -hmm. um, and could, could tell them, you know, where they can get more information about that specific thing or the mm -hmm. caption can tell them, or you can say message us or comment if you want to be directed to each of these things. Um, but definitely like doing a monthly or d d you know, depending on how much stuff is going on, doing a weekly, monthly, bi-weekly roundup mm -hmm. of those things will help you to not clutter up your feed. Um, but it will be a really easy way for people to see in big writing, yes, I want to support Bittersweet and I'm gonna open this post so I can see how I can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great idea, thank you. Oh, there was something in the chat. Um, Will you share the list of social media accounts that you highlighted earlier? Oh, yes. Um, do you mean in the PowerPoint, in the Google Slides? Yes. Okay. We'll also be linking 
um, to all of the, we'll capture the links that were shared in this. And when we post this recording, we like to do a link to the presentation itself and then we'll have all the other links. So we should have that up and out by end of day tomorrow. Yeah, and this is a very non-exhaustive list. There are a ton of other social media pages from different care farms that are doing great things. And I also didn't include any of the care farms that are part of um, like a much larger organization. Um, a lot of those care farms have very strong social media pages, but because I, I just like didn't include them because they have like super huge funding and staff and stuff that that might be a part of their their social media. Um, but yeah, I just included these eight as eight examples that I found to be um, kind of different things from each other that could be highlighted. Um, but entirely, as I already said, like three times, it's a non exhaustive list. Um, yeah. Yeah, real quick question for you at the end. When we're, we're talking about what's successful and what's not, obviously you can see the number of people who view your post and the mm -hmm. more people, yeah, the more exposure. Any other quick things that you'd like to talk about just in terms of like, if you're looking at one analytic to follow mm -hmm. or something that just helps you measure if you're improving or how to improve? Yeah, and it really depends on what the, the purpose of your post is. If you have something that you want to be shared a lot, um, on Instagram, you can click on a post uh, and then see, I'll do this with a post on um, my, yeah, on here. So you can like, this is a post of me. Um, and you can click in the three dots in the corner and click on, wait, where is it? Oh no. Oh. They change where it is. You can click on view insights. It's even easier. Um, and it'll show you not just how many likes and how many comments, but how many people sent the post as a direct message or shared their story. Um, I don't know why this many people sent a picture of me or shared it. That's kind of, I don't know. Um, and then how many people saved it. And so when you have the purpose of getting information or, or just you know getting awareness about your farm or whatever out to a lot of people, you'd want to focus on what is your content that is getting the most of this little paper airplane symbol? What is being shared out the most? What do people see and they're like, oh, that's something that my followers would find useful or entertaining. Um, and then if you have something that um, is kind of like something for people to reference or something that you want people to find important in a personal way, if that makes sense. Um, like if there's information about how to donate to you or, or something like that, um, then seeing where that save button, uh, the little bookmark button has a lot, can be very useful. Um, and kind of seeing like which posts have this, and then that's how I'm going to replicate them. And Instagram now um, is focusing more on, I think I mentioned this in the engage point, um, but they're focusing more on posts that have a lot of share and a lot of save because liking a post doesn't doesn't really mean much. It just means you clicked the button. Um, and commenting um, is also just, I like, it's very easy to comment on a post and not have any connection with it. But for you to share it with someone, whether it's in a message or on your story, that means that you find so much value in the post that you think others will find value in it too. And so Instagram pushes out those posts that have lots of shares and lots of saves now more than focusing on the amount of likes and comments that a post has. And if you don't see lots of shares and saves on your posts, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it just means that your posts aren't something where people, you know, think that the people who follow them on social media are very likely to find that information useful. That doesn't mean it's not useful or entertaining or inspiring or any of the other things to them. Well, we are up at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern here. That hour went by quick. Maybe it's just because social media is earth shatteringly exciting to talk about or, you know, horribly scary for some of us. But thank you, Gabrielle, for making it easier to understand and sharing tips and tricks and to others who joined in. It's always so fun in these gatherings to see who's here. As always, next month, we are going to uh, be reconvening on the first Thursday of the month, more on our website there. And by tomorrow, we'll have a bunch of links to share out with this presentation, including the recording. So with that being said, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day. and joining us and you have a great rest of your Thursday. Thank you, Gabrielle.
Thank you. Oh, I was just typing in the chat. Feel free to message Care for a Minute on Instagram or um, to connect in any other ways if you have any questions in the future. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you.